Hi, everybody, and welcome to Under the Forelock. I'm Betsy Billhorn, and it is my great pleasure today to bring in Marianne Campbell, who is another interesting person talking about interesting things with horses. And Mary Ann is an instructor and a clinician. Um, she works with the uh, Foundation for the Equestrian Arts, and her philosophy is about empowering riders to work more effectively with their horses without sacrificing that joy and that horse and rider connection that we all want to have with them. Um, she's been riding since 17, uh, been doing this for a very, very long time, has uh, been exposed to a number of disciplines, self-taught, studied under a uh, student of uh, Tom Durance's, uh, but have done everything from you know, hunt seat to eventing. You've also managed very high-end uh, show jumpers. You ran a riding school, and now you are with the foundation in teaching classical French equitation. So welcome, Marianne, to the show. Thanks. It's fun to be here, Betsy. Yeah, yeah, and it's great to have you here. So you have done all kinds of things in your life with horses, and uh, you know, I mean, I, I guess we could say you've been around the block a few times. I've right? been around the block, <laughs> and um, I I first got an education at seventeen. I first I found out you could take lessons when I was seventeen, but I began riding when I was four. Oh, wow. Wow. So, so your whole entire lifetime, basically. So yeah, when we talk about self-taught, we're, we're talking about the sort of thing when you, some parents teach you how to swim by throwing you in the pool and helping you float. Yeah. <laughs> and, and in my case, that's how the riding kind of went at first. My parents didn't have the funds and, uh, and didn't, uh, didn't encourage me to go figure out that somebody could be spending a lot of money teaching me how to ride. And, and instead it was drop you off at the neighbors, drop you off at a friend's and throw yourself up. And, uh, so I learned a lot about keeping on a horse's back and not, uh, not falling off. No matter uh, what's going on, right? No matter yeah. what's going on. A lot of trail riding in the Oregon Hills. And, uh, wow. and it was a joy. It was yeah. just a joy. Yeah, amazing. So, so, so for me, when I began taking lessons was both when I began learning that people had some pretty interesting ideas about how to do this and some good pointers and good suggestions, but also that I learned that people had a lot of opinions mm -hmm. about how it was supposed to happen. And, um, and that, that uh, there was a lot of tension and a lot of wanting to do it right, you know, different, uh, sort of different tribes in equitation. Yeah. And uh, I, had the, I had the fortune I, it was a perfect start for me because uh, I, w I was at uh, UC Davis getting my degree in art and UC Davis has an equestrian, or has had, I don't know if they still do. Oh, they, st they still do. Yeah. Do they? Yeah. They yeah, have they an equestrian do. center there. Um, yep. And, uh, and so that was where I started taking lessons and they had trainers from every discipline. And so not knowing any better, I took lessons with all the different trainers. And it was wonderful because I got that smorgasbord kind of feeling that, wow, you know, these people like the horse to carry themselves this way. And those people want them to carry him this way. And these people aren't talking about carriage at all. And these folks want me to sit here. And those folks want me to sit here. And these folks aren't talking about seat at all. <laughs> and it, it kind of helped to get that there's, uh, there's different applications depending on what you're doing with a horse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to turn it into a religion. It has to do with what's, how the horse moves best, given the application that they're up to. Interesting. And, uh, yeah. yeah. And that's when I first began studying the French classical work with Craig Stevens 20-some um, years ago. Uh, what I found there was it was very old work. Like this is, this is thousands of years old, the work that we're doing. And what you're looking for is a horse that's relaxed and balanced and moving in its best possible way. And it's such a different place to stand than, than so much of what I see in the modern world, um, just because we've gotten separated from working with the horse in a, I don't wanna say a more natural form, we're, we're, uh, you know, when I first learned to ride again, it was just me throwing myself up there back on a horse and heading it to the hills in Oregon. Um, and that asks you some really basic questions. Are you going to fall off or not? Can you stop him? Can you turn him? Right? Right. Yeah. As opposed to when we get into a competition-based culture, mm -hmm. are you wearing the right clothes? 
you know, have you, is your horse the right color? <laughs> well, the right breed, yeah. The right yeah. breed. Are you and your horse well matched? You know, should right. a person who's who's carrying some extra weight be sitting on a horse like that? You right. Know? Yes. And yeah. All that stuff. Um, it's it's a very status oriented place to come from, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> so what I when I look at the French classical work, there's two real lineages that we're working with at the foundation. One is that was is French classical itself, which you can trace right down the line um, from teacher to student, teacher to student, uh, back to the Italian Renaissance. The Italian Renaissance moves that work, or France takes the work from Italy, pulls it into France and does some amazing stuff for a couple hundred years when the uh, King of France decided to, to fund equitation as being a really important national treasure. And boy, that's a nice thing when that happens, because they could just focus, the trainers could just focus on their art form and, and on developing riding to the nth degree. And and it's easy when, as soon as you say art form, you know, I work for the Foundation for the Equestrian Arts, mm -hmm. people assume that means you're, you're poncing around doing poncy things, and, right? And I was gonna, and I was just gonna ask you that, right? Because I think there's, um, you know, when you say, oh, French classical equitation or, right the art of writing then yes. you know it's 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 a very binary thing right because it's like oh like you said well we're going to be you know and yeah. you know and i think that it's also i'm going to maybe inject something a little provocative in here but i think sometimes that people tend to also think that you know oh that those people those people are very anti competition they're very anti you know it's all my way or the highway you know that there's um a, a kind of a radicalism about it right? right uh you know i only do it the old way and you're bad and so <laughs> then we start having these you know kind of tribal uh, warfare yeah, yeah and these yeah. you know forum flamers and stuff going on there yeah you know? so um there's a lot uh, of that and 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 i salute it because i think people enjoy it but I don't take part in it. Um, we, we have riders who are, who are riding with French classical principles who are working cattle. Yes. And yeah. we have French classical principled riders who are show jumpers and who are doing three-day eventing and who are putzing around with their horses on trails the way I did when I was little, only with a little more information and a better seat. Yeah. Um, so the, the, when we talk about the principles of the classical equitation, French classical equitation, and when we talk about this, the second lineage that, that underlies French classical equitation, which we call the Mediterranean work, Mm -hmm. um, and we call it that because the person who taught it to us called it that. And so out of deference to Pucci, to the trainer who taught us, who prefers to remain anonymous, and that sounds like I'm, you know, I don't know, blowing smoke and mirrors, but that yeah, is his yeah. preference. Yeah, yeah. The fabulous <laughs> man who Pucci. smokes incessantly while he's training. It's the most interesting <laughs> thing. But so, so what he taught us about was a way of working with a horse from the ground that once we began using that, uh, began infusing everything else that we're doing with the horse. There's a, uh, a principle, I know we're not supposed to touch our faces now, but I do. <laughs> you can do whatever you want. It's, good. It's, it's, it's the <laughs> we're not on world news tonight, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a principle in, in classical equitation that you'll hear people say, in dressage generally, that you'll hear people say, that comes from a wonderful trainer, from uh, the early part of the 1900s, whose name was uh, General Alexis Lott, mm -hmm. L apostrophe H O T T E. And <clears throat> what he said was that the horse needs to be worked calm and forward and straight, and that the order matters. Calm comes first, forward next, and straight third. And in French, the word for forward does not mean the same thing it does in English. En avant is the French word. And, you know, and here I start sounded like a hoo-hoo. But listen <laughs> to me, bear with me. Yeah. Um, because language to language isn't the same. Right. And so the French word en avant or forward means the same as someone who's forward in conversation, someone who's engaged, someone who you say, hey, do you want to go out and get a cup of, and they say, coffee, you betcha. Like right. they're with you. It's not... Yeah. 
it's not that they're moving faster than you are. It's not right. that they're moving, accelerating in a direction. It's that they're curious, engaged, and with you. And if you've got that in an employee, if you've got that in a spouse, if you've got that in a horse, you've got magic because they bring their whole self to what's happening and it unites with your whole self. That's a really important piece of that triumvirate of calm and engaged forward and straight. And when Lot talked about calm, he said, this is the first of the three elements that has to be present. And he didn't mean that you should <laughs> give your source a sedative. And he didn't mean that your horse should stop, should hold still and pretend not to be upset. Right. He meant that the horse should be at peace, mm -hmm. right? Not asleep, but balanced and at peace. And the rider has to be too. And that's the big distinction for me is that, you know, again, for me as a little kid, I was out there with horses because I loved them. And there was no, like, there was no barrier between me and them. I would just as soon spend the day just laying in the pasture, listening to, me, to them graze around me because I just loved them. And as soon as I began taking formal lessons, people began telling me, don't let him get away with that. Show him who's boss. You've got to make him do this. And I couldn't reconcile that world. It didn't make sense to me that I should jump from a, a friendly relationship with a horse. Well, of course, I wasn't going to get hurt. I was going to keep my boundaries to one where I saw the horses being malevolent. And what Lot's maxim helps me uh, become friends with <laughs> is the idea that that connection, that heart connection that we have is actually the basis for the work. And that when we, um, when we begin with the idea of calm, you're beginning with the idea of balance. You're beginning with the idea of connection. You're beginning with the idea of, of an even breathing rate. You know, what are the things that tell you you're calm? Right. And that's not the faking it. That's not, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you do that. Yeah. You do that facial expression so well because I do that. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I've, calm, calm, I've calm. done that facial yeah, we, expression it, it, through we, time. We all do you know? that. Yeah. That, and it, that face you put on when your, your spouse is running off about something and you really wish you'd stop. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but you lose the joy out of that. I mean, and, and it's exactly it's, it's interesting too because if you're not calm, you know, let's not use the word forward. You let's use the word engaged, right? And you can take that analogy. So take the horse out of it, right? And you and I are having conversation. If you're not calm, you can't engage with me. If I'm not calm, I can't engage with you, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So you know, everything just gets thrown out the window at that point. Yeah. And all of us have had that experience of, of, of having a conversation with somebody where suddenly, you know, you're, you're being distracted by something or you're being, you're worried about something or, you know, you get your knickers in a twist for some reason. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there's some discomfort that's pulling you out of connection. Mm -hmm. so, <clears throat> so when we talk about calm, we're talking about emotional calm. That's an obvious one for us. But we're also talking about physical calm. And what does that mean? That's, that means that your body is at ease. Okay? So when I begin the conversation, I tend to be like this. I like leaning on my elbow <laughs> or leaning on my elbow this way. Right? I don't tend to be sitting as if I was about to meditate for four hours. You know? mm -hmm. yeah. I don't yeah. assume that position. But when I do, when I take my body and put it in a nice balanced position, you can feel all through your body this kind of relaxation that happens. And that's a useful place to begin movement. That's why in martial arts, the, the position from which you begin isn't one where, you're, where one shoulder's up here and one's down here. Right. It's one right. where you begin with that lovely, they call it the horse pose. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, yes, they do. Where you're totally balanced, right? Right. From that physical calm, that sense of being at rest comes the ability to become engaged because you can't if you're if i'm out of balance i have to come into balance i have to find myself in order to push myself forward so that very first moment when you begin working with the horse is as important 
I mean, literally the first moment when you walk out and you see her in the paddock, mm -hmm. that moment is as important as the moment when you're doing the pee off or your three meter jump. Don't do a three meter jump. <laughs> 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 is yeah. it because that's the moment where you set the tone right right and that kind of sets the tone for the rest and but do you think also um that you know there's there's you know we talk about calm in you right so i'm yeah. coming in a barn and i'm setting the tone and you know it's funny because i talk to a lot of other guests and and we have we always have this conversation about it, it happens before you get to the barn right yeah uh but you know the the other thing um that I have had happen, um, and I was just talking to somebody else about this, is that, uh, you know, sometimes you're calm, but the horse is not calm, right? Uh -huh. You know, they're all buzzing around because of whatever is going on, you know, they're mm -hmm. in heat, or there's a construction truck driving down the road, or, you know. Or they had a bad dream. <laughs> they had a bad dream, or, you know, somebody, they smelled the carrots, or what, right. you know. Um, right. So, so in that respect, right, you know, we want both to be calm so how does that right. work so so a couple of pieces in that one is um <laughs> the 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 topic i came in thinking I'd, I'd really want to touch on this with betsy today was balance and, yeah <laughs> and and balance has its expression you know calm on the physical body has to do with balance Right. But on the intellectual body. Yeah, an <laughs> emotional an intellectual body. one too. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, this is the the thing that I run into most often with te with students who come to study with me is um, most of the people, almost no, all of the people. I'm going to say all of the people who come to work with me are people who want to work in a kind and gentle way with their horse, and so they're hoping that I can help them do that. In our modern world, quite often people mistake kind and gentle for being a doormat mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it is not the same you can be absolutely balanced absolutely calm absolutely peaceful and at the same time say this isn't going to happen and so when we're working with a horse who's frenetic or upset first of all you don't ignore it when again when i was a little kid i thought the best riders were the ones who could ride the absolutely nutcase horses <laughs> So, so the crazier the horse with you, the you, person who was sticking on it, the more I thought, wow, <laughs> that person knows what they're doing. Too? Yeah, be the yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. And yeah. what I've, what has happened over the years as I've actually become skilled at this mm -hmm. is um, that I've recognized that when you're skilled, that doesn't happen. Mm. Horses don't go bananas. They might have a moment of insecurity, but then because your handling is good, you can help the horse calm down. So in the same way that if you're, if you're working with a partner or, or children, if the person is upset and you feed the fires of that, they're gonna get more upset. If you're able to listen to it and keep them directed towards a healthier way of thinking about things, yeah, let's, let's look at what's really going on here and tell me more about what's really going on. Good, okay, let's keep talking about that rather than oh you're right you're right yeah 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 ooh, ooh, ooh. right 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 and with the horse what happens is because y you may not have noticed they're bigger than us <laughs> yeah even even the little ones yeah <laughs> are bigger than us. well they pack a punch the little ones right. pack a punch yeah and so until we've learned how to handle them well we are at risk and when a horse behaves in a way that's dangerous our heart rate goes up mm -hmm. our breathing goes up the horse who was already nervous says oh my god she's nervous too and gets more excited and then we get more scared and human beings tend to respond to fear either by leaving which is a smart thing to do or if you can't leave by getting angry because getting angry is a strong thing to do and so you can yell at somebody you can snap that lead rope you can whack that horse like you, you take because fear feels vulnerable mm -hmm. And anger feels strong. And we want to jump out of vulnerability into something that feels strong as quickly as we can. And it's such a mistake. It's much better to have taken the time to learn how to handle your horse well so that you can do things like keep the horse's bend so that if I'm standing here, my horse is wrapped around me this way. That makes it so that if he's going to bolt, he's going to swing around me. His bottom is going to swing away from me. Mm -hmm. So I know 
if my horse is getting nervous, there's things, simple things that I can do that help him to be able to express himself in a way that's safe mm -hmm. for me. Yeah. And if I can let him express himself in a way that's safe for me, typically his expression lasts four seconds, five seconds, yeah, 30 it, seconds at the most. It's not know? really that long, right? Because I've, no. I've, I've had that, that, that <clears throat> happen as well. And, and I think there's, yeah, there's the, the, the practical tactical, um, because I use the same technique, which you mm -hmm. taught me, uh, and, and knowing that I'm in a safe place, relatively speaking, right? Right. Uh, that, you know, I can, then I'm, I can calm down and right. you think this is going to last forever. And I mean, it really is when you, when you look at the time, it's like 10 seconds and <laughs> it, feels you're going, like oh, really it feels time. like 10 years. <laughs> it feels yeah. like, when is this going to stop? But, um, but yeah. And I think though that being able to, to, and I, I think again, again, it comes to balance, right? Because you want to, exactly. you know, things kind of start to oscillate like this, right? So if I'm not at that kind of that frequency, and I'll even sometimes, you know, when, when Doria's really, it hasn't happened in a while, but when she's really going nuts, you know, I mean, I'll like, I'll try to laugh or be like, oh, you silly girl or sing. Um, and then yeah. it, it begins to kind of, you know, and then she gets down, right? And, and she settles down. Okay. Yeah. yeah, she settled down. There's a but, wonderful, one of the earliest, <laughs> I'm sounding really erudite, and I'm not particularly, but one <laughs> of the earliest uh, manuscripts about equitation comes from Don Duarte, who's a Portuguese king. And there's a whole section on it about what to do when your horse plays up. Mm. And, and what he says is things like, you, you, can, you can play with the color of your cape. You can turn it this way, or perhaps a button he says, you can just sort of fiddle with a button. <laughs> and when I first read it, I thought, this is an aristocrat telling other aristocrats, fake it till you make it. Right. But, yes. <laughs> but on further reading, what I saw was that what he was saying was do something that's comforting for yourself. Mm, mm -hmm. Help yourself bring your own mind back to comfort. And that's going to help your horse be comfortable too. Right. right, right. So when we, um, when the horse starts to, to get nervous you know and there's different degrees of this and that's an important piece too but if you have a horse who's out of control nervous and you know the wind came up or lightning or whatever and oh my goodness right. you can help the horse to move in a way that's familiar to it and circular and simple and safe and the horse's adrenaline goes through its system very quickly and then it's gone whereas our adrenaline <laughs> goes through our system and then it stays there for about 25 minutes yes so yeah, that's if you know that uh, what happens is when the horse begins to get nervous, you know that he's not only going to stop being nervous as soon as he's expressed himself, but he's then going to be done with it. And that for me, that really helped uh, being able to process those moments better. Mm. But we come back to the, the fundamental thing is we, we recognize when a horse is blowing up. We recognize when it's like a holy crap moment, right? Oh, you know, he was just losing his shirt. What we don't recognize is that when you step out to the paddock in the first place and the horse is a little bit tight, that's the same, should show up on the same level hmm. as that the horse is bucking, rearing, and farting. Interesting. But that's mm -hmm. way more subtle, right? It's and, much and... more subtle, but we're tuned into it. And this is, yeah. you know, when I, when I talk about empowering people, it's such an overused word, but, um, but people are really sensitive to what's going on with other animals. You know, if I start thinking about my ex-husband, there's a thing that happens in my body. <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you can, you know, you imagine you're dancing with somebody and their ex walks in the room behind you. There's a thing that happens oh, yeah, in your body. Oh, yeah, you feel that. Yeah, okay? yeah. Or, or, and those are graphic and sticky. But if you're in conversation with somebody and you accidentally trip over something that reminds them of a painful memory, of mm -hmm. an anxiety about something they forgot to do, you feel something change, right? Yeah. And it doesn't, you may not know what it is. And depending on your temperament, <laughs> and temperament comes into it with people as well as horses. Yeah. Like one person's going to watch the, the slight withdrawal and they're going to think, oh, I shouldn't have said whatever it is. 
another person is going to see that and go, what is wrong with that person? <laughs> and yeah. anything in between so right. it's not like we're sensitive to it it doesn't mean that we're uh that our intellect is sensitive to it but this this thing that we drive these bodies that we drive are are animals mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we are um it, it, most of us working with horses will identify ourselves as being animal people and quite often we'll say, we're animal people. I don't get along with people so much. You know, people are difficult, but horses are easy and they're wonderful and they're fair and they're all this stuff. And it's true that horses are all those things, but you know what? People actually are too. Yeah. We fake it. Yeah. <laughs> we try really hard to wrap ourselves in, in cloaks of invisibility so that you will think that I'm more special than I am or that, you know, richer than I am or thinner than I am or smarter than I am or whatever, more, have more status than, I, than I'm afraid you'll think I have. But as an animal, we're really, really good at reading it. Unfortunately, as an animal, we're not really good at narrating what we're reading. So one of us will say, oh, what's wrong with me? And another will say, what's wrong with them? Instead of just noticing, ah, a change has happened in that being. Yeah, and I, and you know, I mean, I think also too, then, you know, there's that, and, and then there's, um, there's that, that distraction, right? So kind of what I'm, what I'm thinking about is, you know, I might notice that, but you know, I'm, I'm coming from work and I've got an hour and a half and right. blah, blah, blah. And, and so there's another thing I think not only are we hiding and you can, you know, you can't hide that because the horses are very observant. So you can be like this all day and they're like, yeah, I know <laughs> what's going be, on. Yeah. Not, only, not only do they not buy it, they get that you're really incongruent. Yes. And that's oh. agitating. Right. Cause right. Um, yeah. And, but then you, now you're layering on top this, I've, I, you know, I've, I'm, I've got goals, right. Let's just, you know, I, I got an hour and a half and that, right. that, 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 Right. Uh, and so I need to get through my walk, trot yeah. and canter in an hour and a half. And yeah. right. And then I'm going to bring on another layer that, because you touched on this in, in the beginning of the conversation is, um, okay, well, I have to be this way, right? right? My horse has to trot this way and I have to have this done by the end of this. And, right. you know, and my tax got to be like this and the tail has to be groomed like that. And because somebody will look at it and go, Oh my God, you have a shaving in your tail. You're a horrible, horrible horse right. person. Right. So right. we just add like, right. So no wonder by the time you tack up and you get in the arena, you're, tense you're and so not happy. Nobody's yeah. happy. Right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And, and so, <clears throat> So when we talk about the Mediterranean work, what that is, is separating yourself out from all of that story. And just coming back to the beginning and saying, you know what I'm here for? I am here to really enjoy the company of this horse that I love. And, and so when you come into his space, you don't just come in and put his halter on and get him out to where you can work with him. Mm -hmm. You come into his space knowing that just like you and me meeting one another, you know, face to face in a room, right. um, we don't just start talking right away. You right. know, we have, we have a moment of saying, it's you, you know, connecting, softening the space in between us, right? right. establishing that we're safe with one another. And then from there, we begin the conversation. The conversation with the horse is a tactile conversation. That doesn't mean that the conversation is always about uh, grabbing him and making him do things. Mm -hmm. it's not, it doesn't even mean that it necessarily that it's about touch, meaning physical touch. Right. It can just as easily mean the touch of the space in between us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is when people do round penning work, um, is a place that you'll see this kind of touch where you're asking for the space to, you're compressing the space or releasing the space, mm -hmm. making room for the horse to move. If you're compressing the space over here, you're releasing the space over there. Right. And, and most of us, many of us have, have seen round penning work, some of it good, some of it not particularly, mm -hmm. but there's that sense of compressing space and allowing the horse to move around you. And horses are really good at it, but people are too. And we do round penning type work. All of us have done this when we've moved through a crowd. If you're thinking, think about the last time you went through a, 
an mm -hmm. airport terminal or a school room or any place there's a big group of people there's you know who's passing whom on which side yeah and, and yeah you know which way that flow is going to work we're like fish yeah, you know exactly. we, we know exact and and it doesn't matter whether we speak the same language i was clinicking recently in europe and, and going through heathrow and you'd see these people from literally all over the world and every single one of them you, you it's it's easy as pie yeah except every once in a while that you'll get you'll be sometimes 10 15 feet out and you can read it that you can't read it and you do that <laughs> you know, giggly thing yeah. all over the world, how we dissipate that energy when we get stuck that way is we giggle. Doesn't matter if you're from Botswana or you're from New Zealand or you're from Iceland or you're from Seattle, you're gonna giggle to dissipate the energy. <laughs> and it's yeah. rather lovely, it's rather charming. When you start seeing it as a horseman, it's like, wow, these, these primates are pretty good at this too. But when you start owning your facility in this, then you can kind of step into the conversation with the horse in a different way. And you say, okay, where does, the, if, if I'm going to ask him, we'll, we'll take round penning as an example. If I'm going to ask him to move off to the left, where does he begin to do that movement? It's not when he's trotting around to the left. Right. It's when he right. begins to align his, body towards that concept it's a very right. early place and when we think about mediterranean work what we're thinking about is can you play that edge mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so um typically we're going to do it with a hand on the body of the horse and I'll, I'll lift my hand up just a little and see if the horse will rise with me and then i'll allow my hand to rest back down and let the horse move away and up and away and if the horse does anything more than slightly shift his joints, I've done too much. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So, and then, and then that can be, um, you can uh, amplify is not the right word. Cause I don't right, but you, but you can make that right. You can change that energy to make more movement or not. Right. right? You can, yeah. you can. And, yeah. and, and in working with the Mediterranean work, try not to. <laughs> um, have that as a as part of what we do but we're so right. oriented yes but yeah but how yeah. does this get me over the fence how does this you know we're exactly. so oriented to take it into movement yeah that, and i don't mean to be pejorative here because i, I will go that direction to explain about that stuff too and it is fun yeah but, but to begin with just allowing the horse to breathe into your hand and allowing the horse to breathe with your hand as you as your hand kind of inhales and exhales mm -hmm. um and it's not you're not a plumber's helper <laughs> <laughs> right. well and, and also to be clear too you're not standing there going ooh and dinging bells and you no, know there's like, no, none of that there's, either there's, yeah, there's yeah. no chakras there's no you know incense yeah. um, you can't i mean let me not speak for you if that floats your boat you know yeah yeah, yeah. Cargo, you don't burn the barn down but <laughs> um the the concept in it is to is twofold one is you want to get the horse to relax in your company mm -hmm. two is you want you to relax in the horse's company right and we are so fast our heart rates you know resting heart rate for most of us is around 60 70 beats a minute if you're a serious athlete if you're a marathon runner your heartbeat at rest might be down in the 40s mm -hmm. But that's, I mean, we're talking Navy SEALs. Like very elite, yeah. <laughs> very like the, elite athletes. The 1% of the 1%, yeah. Right, yeah. Most, of us, most of us are looking at around 70, 80, maybe even, as a resting heart rate. Horses' resting heart rate is around 30 to 35. And why that matters is because, imagine what it feels like to you if somebody walks up to you and they have double your heart rate. Oh yeah, it's very agitating. Yeah, it's really obvious, and yeah. it's disconcerting. Yeah. yeah, you know, here's here's an example of us being really good at the Mediterranean work is that we pick right up on it when somebody's got this going on, and it has meaning to us. You know, mm -hmm. what is it that is troubling this person? Why are they upset? Am I at risk because this person's <laughs> having a fit? Right. You know, what's going on here? Same thing happens for the horse when you approach with your totally normal resting heart rate, 
let alone when you approach coming from work nervous that the woman next to you is going to notice that you got the wrong socks you know and all the stuff that we add to it oh right yeah right yeah yeah the horse feels it and wonders what the heck mm -hmm. i don't see any reason to be afraid she's afraid what am i missing so not only are you making me nervous because you're nervous but as a prey animal if i can't see whatever this is i'm really at risk so you're you're pushing a lot of buttons when you come in like right that. and you're saying resting heart rate so let's be clear about that that's your resting yeah. heart rate that's, your um, resting that's heart what rate. you like ideally wanted to get down to when we're going to right so right. i mean you know and that's so you walk in you lead your horse not... into the barn your heart rate's gone up even more oh yeah yeah but but the thing you know and all of us have heard your horse can feel when you're nervous your horse can feel your anxiety your horse can feel your fear but they also can feel you calm down yeah they yeah. also can feel your stillness they can feel your love they can feel your good heart they can feel all of those positive things too and when we focus on developing and building and feeding those sides of our brains those sides of our being that amplifies them in a way that the horse gets easy access to when instead what we focus on is not letting them know we're scared right <laughs> that yeah. lets them know we're scared and inauthentic right but so that's doubly right. agitating <laughs> it's doubly agitating and it's yeah. hard on us too yeah so yeah. this part of what i love about this the very first introductory stuff that we do with mediterranean med mediterranean work <laughs> is that it calms us down and it gets us into the horse's uh time frame you begin to learn what this horse's cadence is you notice that we, we have a horse we're working with in house who was terribly abused he's a mustang off the, the pastures and you know or fields in colorado and god alone knows what his breeding is or who he came from he's, you know mustangs are all kind of a mishmash feral mix but he's tight as if you were about to remove a piece of flesh from his body at all times he's like a rock yeah yeah. And so taking the time with him to from first from space, from outside of him, touch and release and allow him to move away and then release the pressure, the emotional pressure, and then allow him to move away and then release the emotional pressure. When you're polite like that, you're saying to the horse, I see you. I know you're there. You matter to me. And when you've given that information, the horse is much, much, much more interested in having a conversation with you. They're just as social as we are. They're just as curious as we are. And we can bring to the conversation with them something that they can't do, which is individuation. We can bring in, you get to be somebody special. And in the horse world, that's not really a thing in the horse world they're all about moving as a unified herd and becoming more and more connected as a herd and individuality kind of melts into blends into the being of the herd and we bring this idea that you, you know with me you and you and i are a duo we're we're a band we're going to play our own song together and that is charming and delightful for the horse it's not work yeah it's not a chore it's not a you're not overcoming things you're drawing out and amplifying and bringing things up and so the mediterranean work is a lot about that first concept of just getting off at ourselves <laughs> <laughs> and and relaxing and connecting with the horse and when that infuses absolutely everything you do what happens is when you ask for a piaf you're not doing the things that somebody told you are the correct gestures to get a piaf right you're rather feeling how the horse is positioned and and learning from his position how you would draw yourself into a position that invites the lovely little beginning play with balance that a piaf is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it becomes effortless and it becomes fun and it becomes curious and if your horse is you know doing kind of what's the word a desultory piaf uh, 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 uh. instead of that being a reflection on your skill level and something he should stop doing and i'm gonna hit it and all that stuff right, it's right. like 
how do I bring this lagging musician into a more joyful connection? How do I bring this music up? How do I help him to play? And if you're doing, if you start with that lovely Mediterranean connection, you have a conversation, you have a, you have a way of speaking with one another that's a shared beneficial arrangement. And that's, that teaches, infuses your body <laughs> with yeah. how to ask for what you want. It's, yeah. it's, it, it, it's almost like an energetic thing, right? You know, and, I, and again, I don't, I don't want to get woo woo, but I might get a little woo woo. We'll just not, we'll not call it <laughs> well, woo woo. It's, but, it's energetic in the same yeah. sense that moving through a crowd in the airport is energetic well in the even, same sense um, yeah. dancing right you know yes. you have a partner you know you go out dancing and you're like oh my god that was the best time i've ever had and you just feel very joyful because they they've got that joyfulness around them and right. you just want to do that you know even if you don't like dancing but you, you know so come on come on you can come out with me and you know you feel yeah. like safe to do that versus um it's just not quite there right, <laughs> right? you know and i'm dancing you know you're dancing with yeah. somebody you're falling in love with this, oh, there's a like, whole different aspect than if you're dancing yeah. with your nephew that you're supposed to dance with because it's his big sister's wedding and he's stepping on your feet and he's 14 and he's got acne. <laughs> you know? It's like, yeah. you do it. Yeah. And, and he took four dancing lessons. So he knows where his feet are supposed to go. And you know where, you know, there's no, like the music happens and you are moving, but it's not dancing. Yeah. And, yeah. but that thing that happens when we begin to connect with somebody and, you know, I've used the analogy of falling in love because it's such a lovely, suddenly permeable space to do that. Right, but right. in the same way, I mean, like my, my sister Margaret and I love to dance together. We have since we were kids <laughs> because we just riff off of each other. We just play and we draw each other out and it's way fun. And we don't care. We didn't care when we were 18 and cute as buttons, both of us. And we don't care now that we're in our 60s and slightly less cute than buttons. <laughs> we still just love that space together. And who I am dancing with Margaret is different from who I am dancing with somebody else because we have a different, we make a different poetry, right? Yes. We make a different song. Exactly. And so, so going back to that though, right, you know, we're, we're talking about analogies, I think with, you know, people that we're falling in love with or people, you know, your sister, um, but like going back to the horse, right. Mm -hmm. The Mediterranean work, I think there's an application, what I'm hearing, and I'm just replaying this for people who are viewing this and, and being exposed to this concept for the first time. I mean, there's an application of it, uh, one in all of the aspects of your work, right? So it's not Absolutely. like we'll sit there and be goo goo for 45 minutes and then I can ride, right? You know, it's, it's, it can be a very <laughs> brief thing, yeah. it's you know. Not that you come yeah. and you go, okay, here's my five minutes of Mediterranean. Five okay, minutes, that's done. Yeah. Now I can, yeah. Right, right. It's not part of your warm up routine or your cool right. down. But, but there's, um, there's an aspect of it too of, um, I think it very deepens, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's good for very deepening and, and adding a lot of texture to the relationship that you have with your own horse. Right. But, um, you know, for some folks here who, you know, they're going and riding a different lesson horse every time or, you know, schooling different horses, um, you know, the Mediterranean work there has right. an application, right? Because it's kind of going back to that, hey, who are you? Um, Very you know, much we're, so. we're going to feel each other out. And again, it's not 30 minutes of, you know, doing no. weird stuff. <laughs> it's <laughs> so. good when, when you're first learning it, it's good to, or first experimenting with it, it's good to mm -hmm. give yourself some time to play with it. Sure. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and I know that uh, there's like, there's an application of it. For, for instance, if it's incredibly snowy and you can't get your horse from your stable into the arena to work or it's you got an ice storm going on or whatever there's a reason that you can't work with the horse a horse is injured you're injured mm -hmm. to be able to work with the horse in the stall in this way you can you can create incredible connection and real benefits and lasting useful stuff in the body from the proprioception of moving him around helping him to move himself around on his joints getting you connected with that all of that, you know, really deep focused, intense Mediterranean work is very powerful. And as you get conversant in it, whenever you go to get a horse, the, 
it takes seconds because yeah. you're twigging to him. You're focused in him, with him. You have a different listening for them than you used to. Again, the beginning that I had, once people started teaching me how to do stuff, was so abrupt. Just get the halter on the horse, get him out. Of, don't let him eat any grass. You know, a whole bunch of, of don't do's, a whole bunch right. of stop that's, right? Yeah. And, and it's not that, you know, this is the that balance thing. It's not that you're supposed to be so woo woo that, the, that you never put the halter on or that if you do, he should be happy and should stop and graze. And it's not that suddenly you don't exist and the, and the desire to work him doesn't exist. It's that it happens in a listening format. Right. And for yeah. any of us, for women who've been in relationship with kind of controlling men, mm -hmm. for uh, men who've been in relationship with controlling women. Right. Yeah. You know, it does happen. <laughs> <laughs> and for any of us who've been employees or right. employers, yeah. right? There's a thing about um, being able to elicit the best from somebody by listening to them, by being there for them, by being present with them, by knowing them deeply. You can, you can create there the opportunity for that person to, to speak, for that person to be the best employee you've ever had. And that doesn't mean that you sit there and let them dominate the entire staff meeting, right? <laughs> no, no. Right? But, so but there's you... a there's, there's, a there's a play there's a balance there and right. and you know and the 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 interesting thing about that too is um i don't know how many times when you're sitting down and you're like i'm going to give somebody space and time and i'm going to listen to them right. i don't know how many times this has happened where they start telling you a story or something about themselves that you had it's it's complete you would have never in a million years right and it's right. really cool or it's super delightful or it's the funniest story you've ever heard and your perception of that person um shifts tremendously uh but i think i think that also happens a little bit in the mediterranean work at least my experience right. in working with it is um you know you see you, you can see some very different things, right? right? And you can get some very different conversations right. in those moments, um, right. you know, so, and yeah. Part of what comes out of that is that as you get conversant with your horse's responses, and again, as you get really good at this, yes, there's times that I do nothing but Mediterranean work with a horse because that's where, that's the right place for me that day. Right. But it infuses everything. So, so when I go to, to ask a horse to work with me, I'm stepping into a conversation that's based on how do you feel and how do I feel and how can I make us resonant with one another yep. so that the work that we do together is, is friendly and harmonic and connected. Out of that, everything is easy. I'm not talking about being woo-woo and nothing happening. I'm talking about getting flying changes of lead at every stride without like effortlessly. And oh, you not mean not going like this and this? <laughs> and you're not so, whacking yeah. the bejesus out of the horse. Yeah. yeah. You know, you, you feel through your body, when is the right time to ask and how is the right way to ask? You don't have to have me and 17 charts telling you the, the combination of the aids, you know, put your leg here, put your other leg here, put your hips here, put your shoulder there, you know, and you put your right foot in, put your left foot up. This is like... All of that's just the description, like uh, like the like the the little feet painted on the floor to learn how to dance. Right, you know? right. That's, those are those are words for something that happens on a Mediterranean level. Right. When you when you, and until you've done the work, it's like I always feel like I'm going. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, it's 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 kind of um, and and speaking as somebody who's done it now for what I think eight years. Um, you're very clumsy in the beginning. I mean, I, I, re, you know, I remember watching you guys do it and I was like, Ooh, this, I, you know, and then, you know, I, I'm like, you know, and the horse is like, <laughs> yeah, it was like, what the hell, you know? And then my own horse right. was just like ears, what, you know? And, but you, you know, like anything else, right. You, you get more, uh, you get more practice. Your timing is better. You're right. listening better. It's just, you know, it, it's right. like learning any other skill and, and you get more subtle and nuanced and, and, you know, you have a certain level of mastery around it. Although, right. 
you know, there's always a new horse that, <laughs> I mean, I kind of like to play with it at the barn a little bit, you know, when you're uh -huh. going in the stall and there's a new horse there, you know, and, and, and do that to greet a new horse. And, and it's very interesting to watch that distances. Kind of yeah. And, and what happens and, yeah. you know, it's something that you can play with. Uh, and, you know, so going back though, to the topic of balance, because I think we've uh -huh. talked about a lot of this in the Mediterranean work, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, in the saddle, uh, right. Yeah. So there's a whole nother challenge. There's a whole nother set of issues there around balance, yeah. which is your, you know, we've talked about mentally unbalanced is a way strong term, but, you know, we've talked about on the ground kind of being centered and balanced and that rate, right. right, that relationship and that tactile relationship with the horse. But then now we're in the saddle. And now right. we have a new set of challenges around balance. We have physical. a very big set yeah. of challenges there. And it's, right. and especially in modern riding, it tends to get overlooked. Um, mm. And here again, you know, I started as a little kid throwing myself on horses and I learned a kind of balance that was based on don't fall off because I'm going to be miles from the stables. And if I fall off here, I'm walking back and it's, you know, it's not a good idea. So yeah. even I mean, it's too little to think about and you might be killed. <laughs> well, yeah, I was like, you know, my adult brain's going, well, what about the like maimed or killed injury? Yeah. Part no, that, that didn't show <laughs> up for me yeah, as a kid exactly. at all. No yeah. helmet. Oh, no yeah. nothing. Oh yeah. Barefooted. I know those with the jeans, jean shorts on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. You got it. Um, but, um, and people said I had a good seat because I didn't fall off. Mm. Right. Then I came in, to, I met Craig and I started doing the, the uh, cavalry seat work, the seat work that was done to train cavalry officers how to not fall off. And, and here again, they had an incentive because if you fell, you died. Right. And so the French cavalry invented some really serious balance tests. And uniquely, this is the important part, they didn't tell you how to sit. Hmm. What they did was they put you through balance exercises and told you to find your best position. And within that, there's the concept that your best position is going to feel safe and balanced. Now, there's a few uh, things that are normal that will show up when one is safe and balanced. You're going to, your balance is going to be on your ischial bones, on your sits bones. Mm -hmm. Um, your legs are going to be draped and hanging down. Your shoulders are going to be back and open. But if I tell you, put your shoulders back, drape your legs, and be on your ischial bones, you can take a position that describes in every way, that meets that description in every way, and still not be balanced. So the important thing is for the teacher is to point out the types, the, the sort of basic broad stroke things, and then emphasize You'll find it yourself when you feel yourself at ease, when your body is comfortably able to hold itself, when breathing becomes natural and easy. If breathing is easy, it means that your rib cage is able to move easily, which means that your spine is aligned correctly. And all of that makes it so that when the horse moves underneath you, you can move with him in a supple way, like a willow wand, mm -hmm. instead mm -hmm. of, correctly holding your position like riding Barbie. Right? <laughs> um, so it's, and it's really important. And especially because so many of us are taught to ride these days in a competitive atmosphere. And I do not in any way dislike competition if, if the person is coming to it with an attitude that feels good. We have they're, many riders who are out there yeah. competing and they're really happy. I'm, I'm fine with that. Yeah. What I don't like is the emphasis on if you don't win, something's wrong with you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What I don't like is when we get our mindset in trying to look like we're in the right position, trying to look like a balanced rider, instead of actually exploring balance. And you and I, you know, most of us learn to ride a bike at some point as kids. Right, right. And if you go to a five-year-old who's learning to ride a bike for the first time and you say, this is how you do it, and you tell them exactly how to place their body and how to make it work, you can be totally 100% correct in everything you say, push the little kid out and he's going to fall over. Exactly. Well, cause and you're, you're overthinking and you know, you get tense, right? You get yeah. tense. You can, you can try everything you want to try. The problem is that words aren't balanced. And, and so the feel. definition, right. And yeah. so the, the distinction of where to be on a bicycle is something your body has to find. 
and it has to find it every day. If I go out to ride my bicycle and I'm four years old, I've got one body shape. If I go out to ride when I'm 16, it's another. If I go out to ride at 61, it's another. Right. And so you have to have a living, organic question. Where is it that I feel this bicycle is not going to tip over and is going to be maneuverable? Same thing's true for riding the horse. But to the horse's undying pain, and I do mean pain, <laughs> <laughs> Between us and falling down is this horse-shaped pillow. So there's a whole lot of room for us to be out of balance and not know it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The horse knows it. You know, it, it, another analogy, if you think about, if you're carrying a child and you're going across a really slippery, icy sidewalk, you want that child to be still and balanced. Right. You don't want the kid to, you know, torque around and move. For the horse, every moment is as important to him as you on that icy sidewalk because in the horse's natural world for millennia if he fell he was prey he right. was eaten. Right. Think about all those national geographic things you know there goes the gazelle he's going to make he's going to make it he falls you know what yeah he's and, he's and then you're done right you're and then you're yeah. done yeah so losing your balance losing your feet from underneath you is the is this huge huge uh, atavistic horror mm -hmm. for a horse. You put a rider up who's trying to look like she's balanced and assuming the position. I remember the <laughs> the first trainers who were who were working with me and they, you know, you put your shoulders back. And oh, Marianne, I was always like this. Yes. Oh, Marianne, you gotta yeah. you gotta bring your head up. You should be like a Christmas ornament, you know. And I'm like really doing my best to be be have right posture and, yes. yeah. and when i got to the correctly tight butt stuck out uh, elbows clamped at my side place they said that's correct and so what it identified for me was and again luckily i was at uc davis working with lots of different people and each of them they had their own mold right of what right they're, they're, to be. they're correct seat style right, right. yeah so yeah. i yeah so <laughs> so when i'm working with the reigning trainer they're telling me one correct seat style and i'm working with the hunter jumper guys they're telling me another one and the dressage lady was telling me another and then the <laughs> the, the western trail people had a yet another and but they were all very specific and so what i learned was to is isolate the quality the particular quality of stiffness that meant i was correct for this teacher Ah, okay, when I feel my tailbone arching back like this, that's going to make my hunter jumper person happy. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. when I feel a strain in my hips, that's going to make my dressage person happy, you know, exactly. et cetera, et cetera. There's all these different uh, locations that, that I was taught to look for to identify that moment when the teacher would say, that's correct. Right? Yeah. yeah. French cavalry training, they didn't do that. And when I teach the seat, Mm -hmm. Bet I don't do that <laughs> because what yeah. I want to do is I want to get you identifying what balance feels like. Mm -hmm. And I know that after you've done the seat work to an extent that you're able to walk, trot, and canter with no stirrups and no reins, moving your arms about, moving your legs about, and you've actually got an easily following seat. I know that you'll be, that anybody looking at it would tend to describe it as the shoulders are back and open. The, right. the uh, bottom is moving this way, the legs are draping that way. But I can't describe it to you because your body's different from mine. Well, and, and everybody has different, um, I, I mean, as I'm hearing you talk about this, and I'm also remembering, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, I mean, we've all taken lessons from different people and done different right. disciplines, or maybe we haven't, but um, yeah, I remember that, you know, shoulders back, you know, and, and, and the thing is, the other part is, you know, you, especially as a beginner, you, you, you're not holding yourself in that way. Right. So there's the whole, uh, fatigue aspect of, right. So you're on this horse, you're not feeling balanced. You're told to be in this place. You want to please your trainer and you're holding yourself in a, bo in a body position that you are not accustomed to doing. So now you have that whirling around your head. I mean, I, I and you're on a horse yeah, and it's scary. And you're on a horse and it's scary. <laughs> and right. I mean, you know, like, I, I've done like some meditation work and I was at this retreat and, you know, we had to sit in this very specific way for a half an hour. Right. And, right. you know, and I'm, I remember being so panicked. This is supposed to be relaxing. <laughs> I was like, 
right? Because my legs were falling asleep and oh my God, and I have to sit up straight and right. So it's like the same thing on the horse. And so you're exactly. not looking for a balance and you're really not in a balanced position right? because you're so, so, uh, so, so, so stressed out. And then because you're so stressed, yeah. right? Exactly. And, and, and the worst thing that happens is when it becomes habitual mm -hmm. to hold yourself in that stressed position, and it shows up as being the right way to be. You know, I am now in my riding Barbie body, you yeah. know, with my knees bent here and my hips bent there and my back yeah. opened here and all that. The, and it's so frustrating. It's like, it's like when you look at those, um, if you've ever been to a Japanese restaurant and they have the, the pictures of the food in front or maybe even little plastic plates in yes. front, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's not the food. That's not the food. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yeah. And we we want to really get that balance is personal. It only you can feel it. That what balance feels like is calm. Balance feels like physical calm. And and when you get one of the fun things that I've started picking up on is once the balance is working, once you got it and you're really tuned into it, if you find yourself suddenly thinking, shoot, did I turn the kettle off at home? It could be that, this, that your body has a slight sense of discomfort that your head is now trying to apply a narrative to. Mm -hmm. So quite often, if you, if you adjust your seat, calibrate your seat, we call it fix your seat, yes, get yourself yeah. back into a nice balanced position, suddenly you'll remember, yeah, I did. I turned it off. It's okay. Um, <laughs> the, the, there's this, this awkwardness that comes from discomfort. And we all know it. I mean, yeah. it, I had I had a bout with a frozen shoulder a few years back. You remember I do. Betsy? I was, yeah. I was at a clinic at your place at the time. That's right. Yep. When you're in really acute pain, it's really hard not to blame it on the people around you, not to take it out on the people mm -hmm. around you. And you have to know, no, 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 this is this is what's hurting me, not them. Right? And we've all done that. You don't get a good night's sleep, all of a sudden you're snapping at people. We're not good at identifying discomfort as discomfort. We're good at applying a narrative and throwing it on other people. Um, it's the same thing I said at the beginning about that it's easier to feel angry than it is to feel fearful. Right. It's easier, more comfortable to be mad at you than it is to notice that, you know what, this is scary. My shoulder hurts a lot. It doesn't hurt anymore. I'm fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, that's good. That's good. You know, yeah. I would hope so after this much, you know, many years from that clinic. But, um. <laughs> well, some people, you know, it lasts. But, yeah. but, uh, but in any case, the, the point being that if you, if you get real balance work, if you get serious seat work, what happens is your uh, correct position is something that's intrinsic to you and to the horse you're on. So my correct position on Da Vinci, who's built like a willow wand and has a particular way of standing, is going to be different than the position that I have on my horse Blue, who's who's basically a quarter horse Bill, and he's a he's a real solid citizen. And um, so, where you find your balance is going to to change depending on depending on what's going on with your body. You know, did you get a good night's sleep last night? Are you a little tight on one side? It changes the balance of you. It changes your center of gravity. And if you've learned a seat that's based on what does it feel like here in my heart? What does it feel like in my body? It feels like easy, comfortable flow when I'm well balanced. Then that's what you look for. That's the identifying mark, not whether Marianne says there, that's correct. But when you and your whole sense of self says, that's it, that's it right there. That guide makes it so that you can ride your entire life. Because as your body changes, as it ages, as it gets wider or narrower or stiffer or looser, you're finding your dynamic center of gravity, your dynamic center of motion. Yeah, and, and, and that's right, then we're happy and we feel better <laughs> and we can enjoy riding right and we you can know? enjoy riding and our yeah. horses can hear us better because the horses yes. aren't guarding themselves against the wriggly kid on the ice you know right. sidewalk right so so it's it's the foundation for being able to ride really well when you stop sitting even subtly off balance even even a 
bubble out of plum mm -hmm. <laughs> is enough to really cause not only the horse, but you in your heart to be slightly a bubble out of plum. And again, we don't identify discomfort. We just put a narrative on it. And so we feel like, you know, you're out there riding and your mind gets churning with worries about whether you're being judged or your mind gets churning with worries about whether he's going to spook again at that thing that he spooked at you. Like it, the mind kicks in with negative thoughts when your body is, is tossing up slight discomforts. And if you've had good balance work, you know how to fix the balance of the body and darn if that doesn't quite often take care of the rest of it and make you more available to be able to talk well with your horse. Um, and when we look at the French classical training, the thing that uh, distinguishes the training of the horse for me is it's the same premise. It's not that there's one correct posture for the horse, but rather that you want the horse to be comfortable and supple in his body and able to assume the posture that makes sense for the activity that he's in. So um, if he's working cattle, he needs to have access to the neck to throw himself from side to side. He needs to be able to be on the forehand. It's a useful posture for a cow working horse. Right, right. But you're riding that horse home on the trail. Let him gather, gather himself up because when he's gathered up, he's going to carry your weight better, be more agile, more able to, to move underneath you. And a French classically trained horse has access to all the postures that are, that are useful for a horse to have is no longer associates that feeling of gathering himself up with in order to explode. Right, right. And, and that, Betsy, for me, that was the biggest breakthrough when I first <laughs> was doing this work, because of course I'd done so much trail riding. And the only time that I'd felt a horse put himself together the way they were putting themselves together was just before the whatnot hit the fan. They were, they were just going to go boom. <laughs> they were just going to yeah. go boom. Yeah. So it was in my heart, the feeling of a horse collecting was uh, uh, was the the uh, Jaws music? <laughs> well, but <laughs> you know? yeah, for you that was that was Defcon Five. That, that you know, that's was. Red Alert. That's not a good thing. Yeah, right? here it that's comes. not. Oh, we're gonna have a pee off. <laughs> this is. Oh, we're gonna and, have a wrap. And yeah. because I had been riding horses in their comfortable trail postures and hadn't been asking anything of them, hadn't been educated to ask anything more of them. Right. But when the horse itself had motivation, you know, the lightning came up and the horse began to pull himself together and then the, did that spin and mm -hmm. took me home with alacrity. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, God. <laughs> um, that quality goes through your limbic system. And boy, do you remember when he begins to do this, it's because he's preparing himself to do something ballistic. Mm -hmm. In the same way that for a horse, when he canters, he, typically he's, he's cantering in order to get some speed up because something's happening he doesn't want to have happen or because something exciting on some level has happened. Right, right. When you work with the French classical methods, what you do is you help the horse explore it that first with that lovely Mediterranean work and then building that all the way through, explore those, the weight shifts that are involved in cantering and trotting and pee off and whatever as curious, interesting, fun things rather than as an expression of a narrative in his head. Mm -hmm. And so the horse, it develops the ability to be able to canter beautifully and in a balanced form without being panicky. Right. The horse right. develops the ability to come to that beautiful pee off, which again is a wonderful balance exercise that helps normalize the diagonal pairs of the, the body. It's not, it's not erudite and foo foo. It's if you're going to be out there trail riding, if you're going to be out there show jumping, doesn't matter. The PF is a really gorgeous way for your horse to proprioceptively understand his whole self, to really get into his whole self. And it requires the horse to bring himself together and use all of the energy that might otherwise go into cantering or galloping, right. or trotting, or walking, into yeah. an in-place motion, a rolling in-place motion. And when the horse is permitted to explore these things, gently and slowly and in a curious way instead of being made to perform those things with anxiety and stress the movements that we use help the horse to become more friendly with his body more comfortable with his body more responsive to you because he's at ease with himself 
So he's right. not going to throw himself into a movement or a gait or a change. Well, and then I think also going back to um, kind of drawing it all back together from the beginning, when we were talking about calm, forward, and straight, right? Yeah. So you're in these things that normally would be very expressive and very explosive, but you're in it calmly. Uh, but then there's a curiosity. Um, what I found is, is that then there becomes a curiosity when we talk about that forward of when I am asking for something that might be a little bit different, maybe we haven't seen it before, maybe I'm going a little more over the edge than I'm normally asking in a position or the tempo or whatever, that you get the, okay, I'm going to give it a go, I'm going to give it a little try, and right. I'm going to experiment with that versus going, oh, and then, you know, we crow hop or spin around or whatever right. in the ears my horse likes to do the sewing machine pee off until you know it's so horrible she <laughs> hopes you fall off but but that like you said like that that kind of defcon five you know right. what the hell kind of um attitude so so yeah so it's very interesting how that all comes back full circle it all comes back full circle and, and the, the third element that we haven't talked about is straight right yeah and um <laughs> You know, again, the, the word has in English a lot of uh, very linear con con you know, associations with it, connotations. It's, um, there's a rigidity to that idea, and that it couldn't be further from the meaning of the word. That if, you're, if the horse is straight, he or she is straight because she's equally supple on both sides, equally friendly with, familiar with, comfortable with the joints on the left and the joints on the right. And so it's about releasing that which is bound up. It's not about um, getting the horse to stop being bendy. <laughs> right, or being in a frame, right? You know, or I hear that a, a lot. There, you know, it's gotta be like this and this, and then they're straight. Right. Um, and, no. you know, yeah. Yeah, no. Yeah. It's, it's the same as, as good posture. Right. That, again, when I was a kid, good posture meant you put your shoulders back and maybe you practice by putting a book on your head. There's all these external aids to get right. you to hold your body in a way that your mom says that's right. Right. Again, if you're a singer, if you're a dancer, you've been taught about, or a martial arts person, you've been taught about posture in a much more healthy way. Mm -hmm. That's that, yeah, you want, you want your, your body back in order to be able to have access to full use of the spine, full use of your hips and your legs. If you're, if you're cattywampus, if, you're slight, if your pelvis is a little twisted or you are predominantly leaning on one side or the other, it's going to block the healthy motion that your body could otherwise give you. Same thing's true for the horse. And so the dressage movements were invented in order to help the horse like yoga. Yeah. Pardon me for the chakras and the insects again. <laughs> well, I think we've gotten past that with yoga. It's pretty Sorry. mainstream, right? No, but I mean, but you, yeah, you're exactly right. If 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 you can freely, you know, it's it's funny because there's a a lot around movement training now, right? right? For people, and it's you can freely access your body to be able to do all these different things. Right. Um, and I think then naturally you, right? We hold ourselves and not and my posture is different from your posture. But the thing that I was gonna say is that you see this when you mention dancers or people who are doing movement or martial arts, right? right. Um, there's a certain flowing way that they move and um, they hold themselves very beautifully and you can feel that. But I'm sure if you were to take pictures of that and statically in time, you know, is it exactly correct versus the people that are really like doing this, right? And I think that's right. the difference when we talk about straight is that, the horse is going to get itself to a point where I'm going to be very lovely and I'm flowing and I'm holding myself and I can do this and I can do that versus, right. you know, right. Oh, I'm arranged right in this position. I'm arranged. Aids, in right. You know? fashion. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. A, a big piece of that concept lives in the fact that this is a, an animal in motion. Yes. Yeah. And so we, it's not, when you take a picture, you've got a two dimensional image of a three dimensional object. Right. And this is the thing that's happened in four dimensions. There's a whole other sphere that this happens in. You know, we got talking about calculus the other night. <laughs> about every day because, because calculus describes the movement of a point across time. Mm -hmm. Who knew? Yeah, right. Was right, right? But <laughs> so when you're thinking about how the horse moves, you can't, you, could, you can take a picture of any of that motion, 
and say that's that that's a moment in time in this in this motion but if i stop here that's not the same as this it's not exactly yeah and yeah. so the unfortunate thing about photography and about seeing pictures is you don't get the quality of the emotional presence and you don't get three dimensions and you don't get four dimensions you don't get this thing taken across time um yeah. and that's again what the mediterranean work does is for us as riders is it tunes your heart your soul your emotions in with what the horse is doing so that you begin to be able to read a lot earlier what's going to happen yeah that, yeah. that analogy of the of moving through the crowded airport when you see that guy 12 feet away and you you know you don't know which side you're going on and you start <laughs> to giggle right yeah when you begin to feel the changes in the horse much earlier much earlier in time then we give ourselves credit for what we're feeling where we are such crazy sensitive animals and so with the mediterranean work you kind of slow time down in a way and you get to a place where you're like you're noticing this horse will or will not be able to take the movement that i'm hoping i'm going to be able to do and it helps you to orient yourself to helping the horse place themselves right so that the movement becomes effortless right um if i'm going to step to the right you know i don't i don't start with my posture leaning off to the right i start with my posture with my with my weight on my left hip so that the right is able to happen and even more what i start with is if i'm at the center is a rolling towards that left hip which is a lifting of the right which is a placement that allows me to move out there's all these different elements in it so when we ask the horse to strike out with a, a right lead or whatever if we just are looking for did he wag his leg his right leg forward first <laughs> yeah we've yeah. missed the world mm -hmm. that happened beforehand and um and and we're crazy good at it i mean yeah. it's one of the things i've been i've loved teaching the last several years is is watching people's faces as they're doing something as simple as as taking the horse into a walk and at just watching the rider's face and noticing when she or he begins to to have that that slight change that you know and it's earlier than they know <laughs> right they're not even aware of it um, yeah of the head that. hasn't started talking about it yet interesting the body's got it yeah you know yeah. Uh, interesting so, <laughs> so in my work with people what i'm interested in doing is turning on your native uh excellence yeah because you already are it's just a question of, of uncovering the stuff that's between you and that excellence, yeah. um, which is a way different place to stand than most of my teachers were over time. And it's, it's like, you guys missed it. You've been working with these amazing human beings and yelling at them a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, uh, yeah, it's, it's funny. Cause I talking about the position, I, I had a, a trainer very early on that, um, you know, I was doing the hunter jumpers and she wanted me to sit very much like this. And then when I didn't, she had a carriage whip and we wouldn't be able to do this these today, but she would whack me in the back yeah. and let me trust you when you get smacked in the back with a carriage whip to full speed, you're definitely, those shoulders are going to go back. So yeah, you know, um, so thankful at least people, will, you know, and you don't do that. So <laughs> it's a better no. way there's a better way to do this i don't do that to uh, people and i don't do it to horses for the same no, reason no yeah. and we do do that equivalent of that to the horse too as well yeah. which could be a whole nother you know hour-long conversation um so we uh you know we've talked about some really cool stuff um the mediterranean work how it works into balance how balance works into the seat work how seat work works into the energy and all this really really wonderful thing um and you know marianne thank you so much for your time here now i'm gonna yeah, i'm gonna wrap up and i'm gonna ask you a question i ask everybody in these interviews yep i okay. was not gonna prep you for Ooh. this uh <laughs> 25 <laughs> yeah. um what was your aha moment um in all the time that you've been working with horses that you would want to share with the with the audience well that's a big question um Gosh, there have been so many. Uh, you know, w one of them is the, the thing I told you about where um, realizing that a horse could resemble, a horse could put himself together 
and give me that as a joined joy. Yeah. So, so yeah. that quality of, of finding like the feeling of a Lamborghini revving, you know, mm -hmm. that the horse is completely all of its forces, all of its speed and its grace and its power and its beauty is right there. And I get to be part of that. That was pretty wonderful. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, but the other thing that comes to mind is uh, there was a horse that I had the pleasure of working with in England who uh, had been terribly, terribly, terribly traumatized and uh, had been rescued by a, a wonderful woman who's well enough endowed that she can have nice big pastures for these horses to just relax and spend the rest of their lives being taken care of. And um, and so she, the other horses in her rescue group, she'd been able to do work with and help them. She was studying some of the work in hand that we do that's, again, really good for the horse, really healthy, healthy for the horse. But this particular horse, she hadn't been able to, to do any work with and had sort of decided, well, it's okay, the horse can, can just chill out and, and not do it. And um, I thought, what a loss that was for the horse to continue with its belief that human beings are dangerous and frightening and that it would be might be interesting to give this woman a, a way of conversing with the horse that gave the horse some other aspect of human human beings um and so i, I went in and the horse was in a very large pasture um paddock not a pasture uh, probably 80 feet by 80 feet big big space and as soon as I approached the gate, the horse tensed. Mm. And so I waited until she softened and she had her eye on me. And, and she's way on the other side of the paddock. And, and I let myself gently in slowly and then stood by the paddock gate until again, she let herself down a little. And then I began very gently walking to the right and she began walking to the left. And it, um, you know, many people are familiar with round penning. This, this is in that category, but so slow. I wasn't interested in, can I move her? Right. I was interested in, can I get across to her that I recognize how space works for her? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, so just a little movement this way, just a little movement that way, very slowly, and then a pause, and then back into it. And, and we talked to each other this way for maybe 20 minutes or something like that. And then, and then I said, that's enough. You know, she, it, it felt like it was time to stop. And, and the owner came in and sat down next to me. There's a nice big, you know, it's England, nice big rock. In the middle of the town. <laughs> and, uh, and so we sat and we were talking and suddenly I felt a little. Oh, wow. The horse had wow. come up behind and was blowing in my ear. And, and that for me will be one of the most magical moments. That's working amazing. with horses. That, and there, there, there have been a few, but that one really touched my heart. Yeah, and I think that's why we're 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 with horses, right? Is those yes. subliminal moments? Those really right. just um, the word escapes me, but I think you know what I'm talking about, right? That transcendence, yeah. yeah. That transcend yeah. what's possible, and the, and and again for me that that being with people doesn't have to be work. Yeah. It doesn't have to be unpleasant. You don't have to finish your ride and then say, here, have a carrot because you just put up with me for an hour. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it yeah. can be that like dancing with a great dancer, the pleasure of your company is something the horse looks forward to. And that's right. something, you know, I've spent a lifetime desiring and wanting and aspiring to. And, it, and it's such a joy when you get feedback from the horse. That yeah track. it's it's uh, you know in, in a very small way like it's the it's the coolest thing ever to be at the barn and um sometimes i'm there and i can't ride joy right i'm dropping off grain or whatever but you know yeah. she's you know i've petted her i gave her a sugar cube okay i've done all the things you know and you would think <laughs> they should be like well fine okay i'm gonna but she'll bang, hey aren't we gonna go do something like right. what do you mean we're not gonna you know and i'll go in and maybe do five minutes of mediterranean with her but um, but that she wants, it's like, well, what are we going to do? Right. You know, right. that she wants to engage. That's like the coolest feeling in the world um, right. to do that. I mean, uh, they're, they're a different species from us and we find them fascinating. Yeah. No reason not to be just as fascinating a different species to them. 
Yeah. Yeah. And that's, it's just wonderful when that happens. So we are going to wrap up, Marianne. Thank you so okay. much. This has been an amazing conversation. Thank you. Um, so just a, just a pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if you are more interested in the work that Marianne does, um, she, you can reach her through um, the foundation for um, the equestrian arts. Um, mm -hmm. You can do Google search. We'll also put that information in the show notes. Um, and uh, at the end here, you'll see some some links as well.